Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration, and working in distributed organizations. My name is Pilar Orti, and I'm the director of Virtual Not Distant, a company where we help managers of remote teams to get the most out of online collaboration. You can find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com. Hello and welcome to episode 309 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast, which is a what's going on episode. And we're going to have a look at some recent news and articles, and we'll also see what's going on with uh, some of the tech we use for collaboration, and we'll also share some of what's going on in our heads. Plus, we also have quite some shout outs at the end of the episode for those people who've interacted with the work. So we hope you'll also get lots of value from that, from the insights from people around us. And also listen right to the end if you want to give us your opinion on some stuff we're working on, on asynchronous communication courses and some cohort based courses. But anyway, um, and of course, when I say we for today in this what's going on, of course, I'm joined by Maya Middlemiss. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hello, everybody listening on these hot summer weeks. <laughs> yes. If you're in the future, it might not be as hot, but if you are on release date, it <laughs> probably will still well, be pretty I thought it was hot. a safe, safe guess. So. <laughs> yes. yes. So apologies in advance. Uh, I am feeling like I'm going a bit, like my mind is starting to go, woo, I'm going into um, hyper mode rather than low energy with the heat so ex, uh, yeah so let's let's get on with it basically <laughs> um we've got a, a few things and one of the things that uh, strikes me maya from what we've got because we've got a piece on teleworking as uh, it's being mm -hmm. still called we've got uh, some thoughts on working from home we've got some thoughts on hybrid something that's happening in co-working we've even got a piece around digital nomadism and it really strikes me that we're going back to saying well i'll actually going back with remote now can mean just so is there's so many variations that I wonder whether we'll stop talking about remote and talk only about some of these things. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're going to end up with seven different podcasts or something <laughs> at some point because it really is the conversations become so much broader and what we mean by remote work, you know, it meant a few different sorts of knowledge work and freelancing a few years ago. Now it embraces so much more. And that's a fascinating evolution. Yeah. So we we'll, would love your thoughts, listeners, virtualnotdistant.com for the contact form. Or if you want to email me uh, directly, pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. What do you think? How have you seen the world of remote evolve? And do you think it matters whether we put everything under one umbrella or do we need to separate stuff? So let's start first with the, um, it, it, it's an, an article I found very interesting for different uh, reasons. It's the title is the share of US employees teleworking. Oh, hang on. No, that's not the title. <laughs> that's the. I've got it. It's called Welcome to Remote Works Equilibrium Point. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. <laughs> that saved uh, Ross a little bit of editing. Um, and and i think that the the title is really important because it's um it's about remote work because of covid mm. yeah and it suggests that we're at some kind of pivot um statistically maybe a pivot or leveling out um mm. uh, so it 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 seems like it's it's leveling off and this is in the us so the share of americans working remotely because of covid-19 is leveling off per new government data and the reason why i wanted to raise this article is not as much because of the headline but because if you read into it you start to see that how much we have to be careful with the numbers because one is uh, well, how many uh, people can do their work remotely anyway? How many people actually found ways of doing work remotely? Like, for example, my husband. My husband works in a um, in a workshop, in a f uh, helping students make things. During the pandemic, they had to work from home, and they actually just made stuff up to support <laughs> the students. But for a while, they were really making stuff up. So, and I know that there was this feeling also for a while in organizations of our people can't do the work, but they have to be home. So let's make up something for them to do. So yeah. that might also 
be having an effect. Yes. And I think businesses are now looking at such bleak economic circumstances that maybe they're thinking, we're not going to make up this work anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, people are either going, we're either going to keep these jobs going because the work need, there is work that needs to be done and we'll figure out a way for people to do it wherever that happens to be from. Yeah. And the other thing I like is they, they really make a point of saying this is the share of people teleworking because of the pandemic. So mm. it doesn't actually take into account people who are working remotely because they want to. Or, yes, or we're doing so before <laughs> for whatever reason. Yes, yes. So I think it's really interesting when we're looking at the headlines. So it's leveling off in that aspect. What I found interesting uh, is that, um, and I and I agree just because of what I'm hearing, I don't have massive data, but for many workers, remote work looks like it's here to stay, but early pandemic era preg <laughs> prognostications about the impending death of office life were greatly exaggerated. This is what I'm seeing. How about you, Maya? Yeah, I mean, again, that's it's kind of echoing the same thing of sensationalist headlines. I don't think there were that many people seriously predicting that the office is dead. Um, some offices certainly are, and some probably deserve to be. But it it's almost it's almost stating the obvious. I'm not, I mean, I'm sure people have spent a lot of money doing this research, and I'm not trying to denigrate it. But I mean, it's always interesting. But it they do make it clear that because people who worked remotely before the pandemic aren't included, it, it's a slightly weird snapshot and it's easy to generalize from it, but it's quite an unusual cohort. The other thing I've been thinking about, just had a realization today, is that we've got, so people were working mainly, a, a lot of organizations, people were working mainly in the office before the pandemic, then they all went remote. And now the offices, a lot of organizations have changed their office spaces, mm. listening to their people for all the reasons we've talked about here, make it uh, a place that people want to go to, know why we're going to the office. But many people, and, and, and I'm thinking, I've always had this reaction against um, senior management wanting people to go back to the office. But today, for the first time, I thought, actually, there is also an argument for asking people to go back to these new offices mm. because they are new spaces. And until you know what, how you work in those new spaces, you can't then get that balance for yourself. So it's almost like you haven't experienced what they're offering you. So come and experience it and then see. Yeah. And, you know, fair play. People are changing what they're offering as they, as people evolve different perks and packages and environments for employment. Historically, the fact is now that there people might be offered somewhere very different to come and collaborate and connect or even to do quiet private work. It could be quite a different space to the one you left in March 2020 or whatever. Mm. So hopefully this is part of the new continually shifting dynamic and people might find they love it or they might hate it. They might really miss the cubicles yes. and, mm. you know, the, the old style office. And I think that's probably all combined a bit with the whole COVID nostalgia thing that we'd all love to go back to a time before we knew about any of this. Um, so people might go back and find things have changed in ways they don't always like. So yeah, be good to see some updated research on this as time goes by. I'm sure we'll be talking about it. Yeah, it's that transition period. We're still in transition. I think that, yeah, anyway. Uh, so talking of, um, so talking, well, actually, let's go back to the present, regardless of whether we're transitioning and what we're going to there's uh, something that is uh, on your mind, Maya, about working from home and how the cost of living can mm. affect people who are working from home. What, what's going on in your mind for this one? Well, I mean, it's part of these this ongoing, as you just said, we are still in a state of flux. We are not in any kind of stable normal. And although I haven't lived in the UK for a long time, I do keep up with the UK news most days. And it feels a little bit from a distance watching the really horrific predictions about changes in the cost of living and particularly fuel and heating bills that are coming down the line over the forthcoming autumn and winter. And I was just starting to think about how is that going to affect people working from home because people need to heat and light their home offices or their home workspace. They need power to run their laptops. And when you're hearing about people choosing to turn off things like fridges and stereo equipment or more, 
urgent life-saving equipment, then how are people are people going to be paid extra by employers if they're on low incomes to support working from home? Are they going to keep warm enough? Are they going to keep comfortable? Um, I know we've got some health and safety content to look at later in the show as well. And it all ties into the same thing about employee well-being, really. Are you paying people enough to keep the lights on when fuel bills go up? Was it 60, 70 percent? Mm. over the next couple of quarters this might be something that people have to look at and it's too easily one of those problems that's out of sight and you know it's not something that people don't tend to put their hands up and say I can't afford to keep the room I'm working in warm enough but it could affect performance motivation mood churn and all sorts of things so I'm sure this is one that people who are employing teams of home-based workers in particular are going to have to look closely at. Maybe a solution would be providing access to a co-working where it's warm enough and the the broadband is affordable and things like that. So I don't know. It's just one more factor, I think, that of us all not being in the same boat in the coming storms. Yeah, and I hadn't actually thought about it until you raised it, to be honest. And I think it's a real big issue. Um, Of course, it's going to affect freelancers a lot. But even, Mm. like you say, in organizations, it's we've come to this agreement, but we weren't expecting this. We actually, and I imagine a lot of businesses were thinking, well, actually having people working from home might turn out to be cheaper. And now Mm. you've got this. And the other thing you make it, well, I've got something to say about co-working as well. But the other thing you're making me think is that if um, businesses now might be getting used to a certain level of occupancy of their offices, and I'm sure that they haven't budgeted for 80% of their workforce around, because it's probably more like 60, 50%. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, actually, if people's houses are not being heated properly, if like in the UK, the the... The, the electricity is more expensive until six o'clock in the evening. So mm. if then hang on. Yeah, it's all very well that I'm cozy in the office and in, in home and the commute and all of that. But actually, maybe for the winter, I want to go into the office. Yeah. And in these wonderful workplaces where it is the employee's choice, I think that's a factor to, to I'm sure people are looking at that. Definitely, it could affect the way that spaces are being used, um, the way that public transport's being used. A lot of these decisions are financial at the end of the day. If someone's budgeted, well, at the moment, it's more cost effective for me to work from home because I don't have to have a travel card or, you know, those expenses of parking and things like that. But then you add it all up when you look at your electricity bill and think, well, actually, it makes more sense for me to go and use someone else's heating during the working day then people people if they have been given a choice that choice might change and it might change in ways that employers aren't necessarily prepared for and then you mentioned co-working which actually is make is going to make me very sad because the the co-working industry had took such a hit during the Mm. pandemic and for me it's still the forgotten you know the forgotten cousin of remote work because everyone talks about working from home but actually co-working spaces are really expensive to heat. Yes, I'm sure. And I know that I've not been going to my own space because I knew I was colder there than I was home. So I'm also, that that's also worrying that, that uh, I hadn't yeah. thought of that as well. And, yeah. and obviously the opposite problem applies as well. I saw somebody in a, a local group in Spain recently asking which co-working anyone thought had the best air conditioning in the mm. city because of exactly the same reason. It's not necessarily cost effective, especially if you've got one of those systems where it's going to air condition your whole home or, or off, you know, rather than room by room. Um, again, it might be cheaper to go and use somebody else's air conditioning, but these the fuel price increases affect businesses as much as they affect individuals. So, yeah, it's going to be lots of complicated sums being done on those power bills. Yeah. Listeners, if any of you have anything to say around this, please let us know because we'd love to share it with everyone else. Yeah, and you could tell us anonymously as well if you're worried, you know, about how this is going to affect you and your equation about how and where you choose to work. It would be interesting to hear about that, even if you don't have to come on the podcast or have your name used you know we can you can tell us and we can share it with listeners 
Definitely. And at an organizational level as well, I would love to hear how um, anyone in an organization making these decisions around premise, their premises, whether wh- how what factors are, and how they're doing uh, with you. I know many people uh, listen to us when they're <laughs> driving or uh, walking. So <laughs> anyway, if you remember, let us know. Now, the, you, you mentioned, Maya, the health and safety, and this was actually... Um, we're moving into hybrid, uh, which is that mixture mainly of working from home and the office. And it was actually in a community where someone was asking a question around this and it just got me looking at some articles. And the headline of this article is, where does workplace first aid belong in a hybrid world? And it's an article in the St. John's Ambulance blog. Uh, well, it's, and it's part of, I mean, they do courses on first aid. But I just thought that's another dimension of coordination I hadn't thought of. Have we got yeah. enough first aid as, uh, in the in the building? It's a whole complicated one, isn't it? Because it moves into the whole sphere of health and safety law and who's responsible for what. Um, you know, because I think a lot of these things are shared responsibility between the employer and employee. And if somebody's working from home and they have an accident, then whose fault is that? Who's going to fix it? Who's going to figure it out? And well, obviously St. John Ambulance feel that probably most home-based work is fairly low risk and you're sitting at a Mm. desk. You're unlikely to have a a work-related injury probably, and you don't need special equipment. But yep, it's what about when people are traveling from one place to another, if they're working in a hybrid way, um, you know, they might have an accident then. Who's legally responsible for what? I think it's going to be one of those areas where we're going to see unfolding by precedent as time goes by. Yeah, I like what the, so around that, I like what the UK government has to say. Um, and also I hadn't thought of the co-working again. So they've got just something which I'll just read very quickly. Uh, first aid for home workers and co-working spaces. Well done, HSE. Mm-hmm. <laughs> UK. If your work is low risk, such as desk-based work, and you work in your own home, you don't need any first aid equipment beyond normal domestic needs. If your work involves lots of driving, you may want to keep a first aid kit in your vehicle. If you're self-employed and based in a co-working space, a shared workspace with other self-employed or employed workers, you are legally responsible for your own first aid provision. However, you can make joint arrangements with the other occupiers. Usually in a written agreement, one employer takes responsibility for first aid for all workers on the premises. So this is, you know, we're not giving anyone legal advice uh, Mm -hmm. and we're not advising on this at all. But this is what the um, Health and Safety England um, website says, uh, .gov.uk. And I just, I thought it was interesting because like like you're saying, it's about, well, if your work is risk-free, then you're probably okay. Um, But... Um, always worth checking and actually for yeah. insurance purposes definitely yes certainly for for those third spaces like co-workings I assume they have a kind of yeah. public liability yeah, yeah, responsibility yeah, yeah. as well that if somebody comes into their premises and has an accident or or has a health incident you know they have a heart attack or something that do they have responsibility over and above what they would have for any member of the public or is it different because it's a workspace oh, yeah. complicated I think if you travel around the world, it's worth checking that definitely yes. because and I get think good pro- insurance. <laughs> yes, and def- different countries will have different. Here, it sounds like by law that uh, you are responsible. It says here um, yes. in the UK, um, but that's that's that. And also, one thing is the law, and then the other thing is the perks that the co-working space might have. But anyway, um, yeah. But the, mm, mm? No, it's it's just a tricky one. It depends. Yes. Yes, you're responsible for yourself as a, as a self-employed person. But then if you're in a public building, yeah. they have a responsibility too. If the roof falls yeah. on your head because they didn't maintain it or, or yes. something. Then, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nobody else yeah. is responsible for anything when you're self-employed. But if you get injured by a third party, you might have a chance. Yeah, but I think it's worth having that clarity in an organization as well. If you have, yeah. especially if it's a, um, a hybrid setup, it's okay. When you're not here, what are our responsibilities towards you? And just making it very clear. Um, just going back to the hybrid experience in the office, um, I was thinking that you usually have first aiders in that office. Mm. But if now we're having people who sometimes are not in the office, then again, it's another level. It's not just in the team 
who wants to do what, what day, when do we have desk, when do we need to be together? It's actually also at an organizational level, have we got the number of first aiders we need in this office at that time? And it, that's again, another thing I'd, I'd never thought of when there is such flexibility. It's just another layer of complexity, isn't it? It sounds so simple. Everybody can come in and use the office when they want and it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yes, it probably will, but there's so much to think about and where, you know, where does this legislation probably catch up years later in terms of who's responsible for what? And like all English law, it will be driven by test cases and mm. people will try and figure it out then. Well, on the common sense basis, whose fault is it that this happened and there wasn't a first aider because the first aider only works on Thursdays or, yeah. or whatever? And yeah, hopefully common sense will ultimately prevail, but it's going yeah. to be interesting. So again, listeners, <laughs> let us know if you if, if this is something that you've come up with and what, what your thoughts and your actions have been around it. So let's move on again. We're, I'm so glad that co-working is featuring so heavily. Um, there was a list out that I wanted just to share with listeners that uh, Grow Remote have. Grow Remote are uh, based in Ireland and it's always been about um, helping people in the rural communities access remote jobs. And their and this piece is around co-working stipends. So it's growremote.ie slash co-working dash stipends. And it's basically a list of companies that can hire people in Ireland and that will give you money to spend um, in, on, in co-working. So uh, they will cover the cost. Yeah. And it's, it's a great list, listeners. If you are looking for a, a remote uh, a remote job and you like you don't want to work from home, then this is definitely the the list you you need to be looking at. Yeah, I think even if you do want to work from home, this is a great list that says these are people who've really thought about what remote yes, work true. involves, and they're they're likely to have got this right on so many different levels. Um, I think it's a really nice benefit to look for even if you're never going to use it it just shows that they've thought about what your experience is going to be and how to best support that so it's a brilliant indicator yeah that's right um so shout out to convert doist remote and meet edgar uh some of whom their representatives have been on the show so (laughs) i just wanted to that is that is really Mm. great and this is really important because um so thanks to eva rimbao gilabert who is a a frequent guest on the show and she's uh, someone who's been thinking about remote work for ages in Spain. She's part of the University of Catalonia and one of her connections on LinkedIn shared this very nice post, it was in Spanish, um, talking about how she's seeing just organizations again in Spain not getting it, like Mm -hmm. not listening to the fact that many more people than before want to work from home or co-working spaces. And she was saying, well, they really run in the risk of the international companies taking your talent. Mm -hmm. And this has not been something that has been such a threat before. I mean, in Spain, there's been always a lot of emigration of people going abroad to find work, but this is very different and people usually come back. Digital Um, emigration. (laughs) Yes, is what yes. we're talking about now. And yes. yeah, it's, I mean, you see it all the time in a sort of like the local Valencia Facebook groups and things like that. And people say, well, where's a company I can work for from home? And everyone says, oh, you know, just work internationally. <laughs> Forget about yeah. Spanish companies. Um, you know, that's not how it works. So you won't find anything locally in your field. And there's just this acceptance that it's an international field now, which is great in lots of ways. But It does have implications for local economies if they don't catch up and catch on and change their practices. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's the Mm. (laughs) co-working angle, which, which has all kinds of implications. Again, it's not, it's not just about we'll pay for you to get out of the house. It's actually because we're doing that, we are offering a lot more opportunities across the globe. Yeah. And talking of across the globe, you know, these are uh, segueing very nicely into each other today. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> there was an article, um, I think it was Gonzalo Hall who shared it on LinkedIn, but I'm sure others, on digital nomadism and, and the effects that, and, and how it's been perceived. Mm. So it's very specific. It's in travelinglifestyle.net and it's about people in Mexico demonstrating against 
well, they, they're not really demonstrating against the digital nomads, but they were demonstrating and the presence of digital nomads and remote workers was a factor in that. And I'll just yeah. quote a research from the autonomous, um, uh, yeah, th this is research that's been done alongside the article. A research from the Autonomous University of Mexico found that during the pandemic, roughly one third of people in Mexico City had to relocate. The majority pointed to high rent as a contributing factor. And the article says that the the remote work, the digital nomads, because it's people coming in that just like tourism might, that they're pushing the rents up. And I'm sure there's loads of other stuff going on, but I thought this is something I hadn't expected. Mm, it's tricky, isn't it? I think if you're a low-wage worker in Mexico and you've faced incredible disruption to your life through the pandemic and you've had to move and move your family, I'm sure it looks much the same whether somebody is coming in as a tourist or as a digital nomad and you don't see any benefit to your community and your lifestyle. You just see an area that you can't afford to live in anymore. And, you know, if everybody's talking about remote work and digital nomads now, then that's an easy target but the problems of rent increases have been going on for a long time. I mean, take Spain, you know, the Airbnbification of whole cities on the coast mm. has been a factor for such a long time and the un uneven allocation of wealth and income in so many countries. This is just one physical manifestation of it because now the cafes are full of laptops, so it must be these people's fault. But I'm sure there are cases where there is a lot of very unhelpful representation of digital nomads and I know that there are places where people come in and they don't communicate contribute to the local communities they spend time in co-livings and co-workings and you know a narrow set of places get that income that could be spread through the community and there are other examples where digital nomads as a phenomenon actually bring a lot of value to an area and bring a lot of trade bring a lot of use of hospitality and also bring talent and skill sharing to different areas if the community is built right around it. So I hope this won't be part of a trend. I don't think it will, but I do think that we're also going to foresee a lot of backlash of inequality in the world in the time to come for so many different reasons, which have got nothing to do with digital nomads per se. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really worth, as I say, just flagging just because it, it is that We've, well, I forget sometimes of how this stuff that we are so excited about can be perceived. Yeah, when absolutely. You are, when because yeah. when you're not part of that, when it's actually and 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 it could be. I mean, I I don't know, but it looks like it could be a, a factor because of the opportunity it represents for some local businesses, even if it's a person who has a flat and they want to rent it, mm. <laughs> and then that pushes the rent up because they know they can maybe rent it out for a slightly higher rent than if the person wasn't coming from abroad. So there's it's so it's so in a way. In a way, though, if in a way it means that it's starting to be integrated, that this new way of working and living is starting to be integrated into ordinary life. It stops being that side thing that w that it was three years ago. Yeah. And of course, with anything that's integrated into society, it's going to have some kind of repercussions, in, like you say, in different ways. It's going to change places, unarguably. Mm. Um, and I think it's, as you said, it's really important to remember that actually the whole phenomenon of being a digital nomad is such a first world privilege. It implies that your work and your background is from somewhere where you've got a powerful passport and you've got a high income professional job and you're going to go and have a better lifestyle somewhere where things are cheaper. And the people there do not have that same choice. They can't just decide they're going to come and live in Europe for a year. Mm. and be a digital nomad and if they don't have the professional skills to make a living online and they don't have a passport that gives them access to you know all these remote work and digital nomad visas they all come with income thresholds that you have to bring and demonstrate and it it just kind of if people know that everybody in their country on a remote work visa has to have demonstrated an income of say four thousand dollars a month then they're immediately going to feel that They've got nothing in common with them if that's way above the local wage. So I don't know. It's it's difficult to see how we get past this one other than by digital nomads doing a good job of being positive ambassadors for international <laughs> living and maybe give back a bit and 
go to the local restaurants, go to the local accommodations and, you know, enjoy everything that community has to offer while you're there. Uh, and Maya, you suggested actually that we could also talking about when we were talking about the working from home issue with the electricity bills and stuff, and you, you suggested that we might have an episode completely dedicated to inequality. And I think mm. that's what we'll do because we can spend, I mean, and, and there's so much stuff around this and now is yeah. a very good time to, to reflect on it. So we'll do that. But before that, I want to recommend two books. They are not exclusively about inequality. Well, It features heavily and they're definitely not exclusively about remote work, but they do have some interesting thoughts around some of this that we're talking, even regarding uh, working from home, etc. also. And they are, can't remember the authors, post-corona, which is... It, it That's actually, Scott Galloway. Yes, very good. Yeah. Ding! <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very impressed if you guess my second one. Have you read it? Yes, I have. Yeah. Uh, his podcasts are very good too, if you like being mm. shouted at, but it's just full of truth bombs and... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I like the book very much and I thought it was it was so brilliantly written. I found that I bought, bought it for my mother. So mom, if you have anything you want to share with listeners, because I know she listens. Um, and the other one, which just has this, I found it very interesting because it, it, it brings up some of these things that we might not think about that contribute to inequality. And it's a very different, well, it's not that different book. The, the title could put you off. It's called We Need to Talk About Money. Have you heard of that one? Maya? No, don't know that oh, okay. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, and it's not really. It, it is about someone who talks about their struggles with money as a, as an immigrant in the UK. So, but it's got a lot of these things because it's very uh, new. Both books, well, post Corona was written before lockdown was completely lifted, mm. and this one I think came out just after the the lockdown. So they're very current. So anyone who is interested in just having different points of view and stuff there, and they're very easy to read. Um, mm. But without leaving the digital nomadism topic, Maya, is there anything that you want to report back from that conference you went to a few episodes ago? Is there a, are there any insights, uh, one or two things that you can share with us about that? Um, well, Going back to our conversation a few minutes ago about integration of digital nomads into a community in a positive way, I think I have to say that the experience of the Digital Nomad Festival in Bansko in Bulgaria was a, an example of it done very well, actually. It's a small town. It's a ski resort. So in the summer, normally it would have been extremely quiet, but it does feel like the digital nomads have brought something brought a new season to the town and the festival brought I think it was about 600 people to it was it's a really small town maybe 20,000 occupants or something and it felt like it was a good example of a positive integration using local venues organizing dine arounds in local Bulgarian restaurants and trips to local sort of resorts and spas and activities and things and using the spaces within the town. And it was a great experience as a participant for it to be organized that way because it felt like it was happening in the whole town. <laughs> you kind of walk down a street and see a wristband and it just oh, felt nice. like you were living at a, a festival and there was no accommodation organized. It was, you know, here are some links to some places you can start looking, but it was nothing was centralized. There was no official conference hotel or anything like that. So it just had this feeling that you were, temporarily part of a community although there are co-livings there for people who wanted to stay longer and a lot of people did stay longer you know it wasn't actually that much more expensive to stay for a month than mm -hmm. the week of the conference because things are very affordable there so I think that was a really good example of how it can be done well and maybe particularly if you start with a small community and think about how to sensitively introduce new strands to it that might be mutually beneficial and I know that at the co-living in Banska, they do a lot of skill sharing events as well. So people from the local community as well can come in and learn about digital marketing or whatever other topics. It's not just for the people who are using the co-working or who are digital nomads themselves. So it was it was a nice festival. There were lots of great speakers, um, a really nice community. It was, it was good to do a face-to-face -face thing. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time in a long time. A lot of it was outdoors. So, you know, they oh, did great. really think about the distancing and things like that and trying to use spaces creatively, though I heard a lot of people got COVID right after it. Um, 
<laughs> it's unavoidable, I think, yeah. in spaces like that. Yeah. Um, but it was it was great actually to connect with some really interesting people. So, and they're already talking about next year's being even bigger. So we'll see. <laughs> great. What's the name of the festival again? It's Bansko is the name of the town, um, which is a little ski resort in in Bulgaria. But it's got mm -hmm. a really yeah, the Bansko Digital Nomad Festival is the URL, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Well, let's uh, leave this uh, uh, this world behind and let's go into the smaller micro world of tech. So only a couple of fun things, uh, Maya. There is so there's uh, an update to to Slack that I just wanted to comment on because actually it I think it affects it could affect teams more than we thought. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't use Slack, Slack has different kinds of pricing, like most online tools. And there's a free version, which I have to say uh, we use at Virtual Not Distant. And the um, before, it, when you got to, I think it was 10,000 messages or something like this, the messages would start to archive. So you would start to lose some of the communication. But now they've moved it to 90 months. Uh, 90 days. Days. <laughs> do, both, so do most teams. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Thank you, Slack. Uh, sorry, 90 days or three months, um, which um, which means that after three months, you start to lose your conversations. Mm. And I was thinking, this is a bummer for onboarding mm. because there's always this thing that, you know, I always encourage, have open conversations, do all of this stuff online, because then you can, um, you, then if someone new comes in, they can have a nose around and just yeah. see how people talk. But I mean, it is the free version. It is the free version, but it seems to be sending the message that if you're an occasional user, it's actually going to disadvantage you. Yeah. Clearly they're after the big corporates. But they also, as this article makes clear, they want to be your digital HQ rather than your messaging app. And that means you should be able to go back and find stuff. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, if, if they want that to be that hub, so when someone joins the organization in a year, you can find out the briefings for the last person onboarded to that role, then it's obviously they just want you to pay, which is fair enough. Yes, which is fair <laughs> enough. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a great, I mean, I, 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 Slack and Trello, Google Docs, Zoom. Yeah. They, yes. <laughs> They're just there, aren't they? They're part They're of wonderful. our remote work lives now. They're, they've become verbs and we just use them yes. all the time. So, and you know, fair play stuff has to be paid for. If you're a small team using it occasionally, it's going to start looking expensive or you won't use it as a digital hub. Then you'll have a Trello board as well, where you stick all your stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you'll just slack in and out of it when you need to talk about it or something, but people yeah. will find ways around it, but it does slightly contradict the evolving into your digital HQ message. Yeah, it's interesting. And then there was another one. Um, I have a note here that I don't know where I found this uh, quote <laughs> that I put, um, but but I, but but there is a, a link of something similar. And I I just didn't know about this. I mean, and I'm, I'm not like a super tech freak or geek or anything. Uh, and I didn't know that there was a Unicode consortium which approves emojis did you know that yes yes it's really exciting every year we get new emojis um yeah i don't know still quite how to use the jellyfish one accurately <laughs> and appropriately in every context but <laughs> it's great that these things appear every year and that it's probably a bit like the oxford dictionary's word of the year or something yes. maybe we should start to have an emoji of the year <laughs> yeah so, so I'll just read this out, and I'm sorry that I don't know what I'm quoting, um, but but I think it's better just if I read straight off. So the jellyfish was among 31 listed emojis by the nonprofit Unicode Consortium, and if approved, they will be added to the selection of pictures and symbols used in text and online messages. Suggested uses include to indicate someone being stung by a comment. There's your jellyfish. <laughs> Mm. to allude to someone being spineless it's not very nice or a shorthand to convey jealousy when someone is a little jelly <laughs> others on the list include a donkey hyacinth maracas a hair pick and the sick kanda symbol pregnant men and women were among last year's selections while the guide dog was added in 2019 i i just i think it's it's fun it's, it's fun, fun, but it's also, I mean, that encapsulates the problem, that sentence saying that 
there's three completely different things mm. that jellyfish could mean. So if you respond to a, an online bit of content or a remark with a jellyfish single, then how are people supposed to know whether they think you're being spineless or they feel really stung or you're jealous or they think you're jealous or, I mean, this is the problem with emojis. It's not just like, you know, older relatives misusing vegetables in, inappropriately in family WhatsApps. These could have real consequences in a business yeah. conversation if people just weren't quite sure what meaning of jellyfish was intended. So yeah, it's going to be fun. And and, and it's, it's uh, uh, we're going to step on the soapbox and go, it might feel really odd to have to have a team agreement around emojis and people will go, oh, we use emojis all the time in my life. But actually, because of the reasons that Maya is saying, I think it really is um, because you can use emojis in really great ways. Like, okay, mm. an, an arrow means please pay attention to this or a light bulb means idea that is more important than my other ideas. Uh, plus then all the stuff, the fun uh, and creative stuff around it. So um, we've got an episode. It's episode 294, if you're a relatively new listener. It's uh, what's going on, well-being and emojis from the 24th <laughs> yes. of February, 2022. So, you know, we understand the importance of emojis here. Yeah, this is part of your matrix of communications options. But yeah, for goodness sake, agree what they mean before you start <laughs> um, confusing the hell out of everybody. Maybe it needs to be part of your onboarding documentation as well and hope that Slack doesn't archive it before everyone's had a chance to read it. <laughs> <laughs> move it, move it to a, 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 a doc, a doc. Yes. A doc and then <laughs> make it, keep it live. Um, so, uh, so that's that's all fun. I, I thought seeing us, well, we haven't hit the hour yet. <laughs> <laughs> we will hit it, um, but um, there's something else I just wanted to 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 mention. Something has been going on in my head, and it actually came mm -hmm. from a conversation I had with Chris Coladonato on LinkedIn. And Chris has been on the show; she's wonderful. Um, she's now working as a hybrid work consultant, mm. and I don't remember. Oh, I think it was about uh, it was about communication because she's all about that. But I can't remember the topic of the blog post. It was quite a time ago, but. Through her conversation with her, asynchronous conversation, I started to think, well, I quite like the feeling of thinking of technology as an environment, uh, because I think when we're thinking of physical environments, we understand the need to look after them. And we understand that some physical environments are more conducive to some interactions than others. Mm. But when it comes to the online space, I sometimes feel that is forgotten that we don't look after them as our environment. And actually that sometimes, especially if you're new to this, you won't think, well, this conversation is better had in this tool or this conversation is better had in this tool. So, and I was talking to someone yesterday and when I mentioned the, the thinking of this as environments, they went, ah, because also when you start speaking of culture, then you're not talking about technology, you're talking about environments. Mm. And then you can see how the culture can translate into that environment. Yes, and it gives you a different perspective on whose responsibility is it to create it and also to maintain it and reinforce it and what what sort of behaviours are you trying to nurture by the choice of different elements of that environment, including the tech that you use. Mm. So anyway, that was just in my head. So <laughs> I, thought I'd, I thought I I hope I hope it's useful. But let's go now and listen to what is in other people's heads, and the and those are the heads of some of our listeners and some of our connections. So I'd like first to uh, give a big shout out to Jennifer Riggins, who <laughs> she messaged me, but I was actually on holiday and she left me a voice message and she, she said she, I think we, and Amaya, I think we talked about this in, in an episode about the, the ABBA experience, this new show with, I don't even know if you call them holograms. What do you call them? Oh yeah. They're like sort of avatars or. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and apparently it's amazing. And Jen messaged me and she, she said, I've heard so many people say it's amazing. What do you think about, um, 
what, what do you think about that kind of experience being integrated into the remote teamwork experience? <laughs> and she was actually saying, look for someone to come and talk about it. So Liz, I was going to put it out there. <laughs> if, if, if any of you are in that space, in the hologrammy avatar, uh, recreated virtual people experience, and you are seeing how that could be used in the workplace, it'd be great to, to hear from you. Um, mm. What do you think, uh, uh, Maya? Yeah, I think it's probably an inevitability, um, whether these are sort of manifested in some AR way in front of us or whether we go to some kind of metaverse environment. The fact is, in a couple of years, everyone's going to have the bandwidth with 5G to do really Mm. data rich things, including something better than a a two screen Zoom call. So, yeah, yeah, we're going to find better ways. And it's already there on the fringes, like with Google Starline and things like that, there are these much richer experiences. They're just very expensive and not evenly distributed yet. So we do, we one day we'll have all those body language nuances and things. Um, maybe we can join in some ABBA karaoke as well. Oh, um. Karaoke I'm up for, <laughs> especially ABBA. But you know, all of this makes me so nervous because what I really like about remote work is that it's my laptop and I. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, so I think again that, that, is this evolution, as, as you say, as technology, and I'm sure lots of people uh, would would say to me, well, don't talk to me about any of that stuff you use. I just want email. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's really interesting to to really understand the different. Again, this is just going to evolve, like we were saying right at the beginning, it's just going to create much more diverse experiences of what yeah. working remotely from each other means. And our comfort levels will evolve as well. I mean, think yeah. about the pandemic beginning, how many people just wouldn't put their laptop camera on for mm-hmm. a video call it was like oh no I'm not doing that now it's just normal and everybody knows what they look like um, or how to turn their own feed off yeah. and, yes. and they just got over themselves and we'll presumably we'll do the same with our avatars one day um, yeah. and the interesting thing about these kind of representations is we actually might have a lot more um, choice of how they appear and how we want to represent ourselves, which would be very revealing, even more revealing than emoji choices. But it, it might be that people feel more comfortable hiding behind a 3D avatar that represents them rather than a 2D video image that is them. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, interesting. So for more listener feedback, uh, again, Anna, Anna Nevish, who's been on the show, and she had to say of episode 304, which was with uh, David Stoddard, who's also a listener. <laughs> and he is actually telling us about how him and his team are transitioning to a hybrid workplace. And Anna was saying, I loved how he so clearly states what everyone knows but fails to acknowledge. Right now, nobody really has the answer to serve the transition to a generalized hybrid context of work. We are all experimenting, testing, learning, and iterating, and that's okay. Mm. She put it so well. Had to read it. (laughs) (laughs) Love that. We also have a message from, uh, well, she, she shared it on LinkedIn, Catherine Nicholson, who's also uh, uh, been a guest on the show. You see, listeners, you can all be guests on the show. <laughs> um, so she, she shared the uh, episode on sitting less. And what she said was, um, well, actually, I just wanted to, to, to thank her for sharing and starting a conversation then on her feed on what people do to break the sitting habit. So she asked her network, and I found that very interesting. So, for example, mm. somebody said Pomodoro, they, they use the Pomodoro technique. So they set the timer for about 20 minutes and then get up. Um, and I also wanted to sh- uh, to thank Chris Coladonato uh, for sharing that as well. And then I also want to um, say thanks to my mother, who said that uh, uh, the, the episode was very practical, <laughs> uh, <laughs> together with one we did on my pocket psych. So I just wanted to shout out to... To those listeners, especially Mama de Pilar, hello. It's two mentions <laughs> in one podcast. I think we'll have to get your mum on as a guest soon somehow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she's always saying, you're always telling everyone on the podcast what I tell you in confidence. It's like, sorry, <laughs> the mother of the podcaster. It's all right. We won't tell anyone else. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, those uh, uh, those messages were about episode 306 with uh, Stefan Zavalin, who also has, if you follow him on LinkedIn, he does some really great uh, short uh, things to video that are funny. Around that episode as well, this is a slightly longer piece of uh, commentary from uh, Nikia Talbot. Uh, she said, 
the episode, it reminded me of, and this might be of interest to you listeners, um, these resources, it reminded me of Caroline Williams' book, Move, Inspiring Chat. Uh, so that, that's the book. The book is Move. And then she also said there was an inspiring chat on the Solo Collective podcast about the brain-body connection and making small changes. So, mm. um, excuse me, I'm just going to drink some water. That's part of the brain body connection. <laughs> yes, especially <laughs> I hydrate to, I, as well as move. <laughs> I don't think I've ever podcast uh, recorded in such heat because the studios mm. always have aircon at some point and the house is never as um, as hot. So anyway, uh, so she said, uh, Nikia, yeah, Nikia says, I've completely changed the way I work. A run walk, first thing, a free desk riser I can move around, cafe hop, take breaks, standing calls, walking meetings, etc. sold my car, trying to retrain my brain, exclamation mark. And then she says, she's got a call to action. Time to redesign the office and school space. Hurrah, education is the, another missing thing that we could talk mm. about, but off topic. Um, so time to redesign the office and school space. As you say, we've been taught to sit for 20 years. It's a hard habit to break. Yes. And be yeah, mindful yeah. of the la- <laughs> <laughs> and be mindful of the language we use around it. This is a very interesting point I hadn't thought of with uh, Stefan. Sit less, evolve your work. I love it. Yes, so, definitely a powerful message. And mm. yeah, how many of us recreate that office environment in our homes and just sit all day? Whereas actually, there are so many more creative ways of doing it, and so much healthier ways. Yeah. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, and uh, if I've missed, uh, I've probably missed some bits and pieces that have come uh, through around. But uh, I, well, I just love it because I don't know, for example, this this the summary of the David Stoddard episode from Anna and stuff like that. And then if you can add some other resources to share with listeners as well, then it just makes this a much, much richer uh, episode. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to start wrapping up, but Maya, before I uh, ask you for your final words, if you have any uh, for this episode, listeners, um, at Virgin on Distance, we're going to start, well, we are creating, uh, first of all, uh, an audio first course. And this comes from Simon Wilson and myself working on asynchronous communication. And we were approaching this from a traditional distance learning type course. So no video, but heavy text with maybe some audio complements, some audio versions of stuff. And we started recording one or two things. And we thought, actually, this could be an audio first course. And all that will be will be that you the, the main way of consuming meat you will be will be audio. And then you've got all the other resources. So traditionally, I think that in in online courses and self-paced courses, audio is a support material. But for us, mm. it's going to be the main thing that drives it. I think it's an uh, exciting idea. I'm really looking forward to it. I, I love audio content like podcasts and audio books, and this will add a new dimension. I hope so. I hope there are some platforms already offering audio courses, so we're not you know, breaking doing anything uh, like always. I'm slightly slightly behind the real uh, innovators, but I think that it, it it makes complete sense for also for us to uh, on going on the sit less uh, conversation. Mm. Just moving on for that, it's really about moving away from the screen as much as well. At the same time, uh, I am I've just joined uh, um, uh, a. A Maven Accelerator, which is a, a cohort-based course uh, uh, to teach you how to use their platform for courses. So I'm also planning to have an online course on, well, it's going to be about connection in remote teams in some sort of, in such shape or form. Uh, and we had this conversation in another show a few months ago, Maya, that cohort-based courses, well, they're really just what we used to refer to as blended learning, which mm. is um, people, you have some live workshops, these happen to be online, and then some activities that you can do asynchronously, some materials you deliver asynchronously. So that is really evolving also. And again, yes. I think it's going to become mainstream. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it kind of always has been, hasn't it? It's like a sort mm. of recircling of the whole pedagogical yeah. model. This is how like universities and things have always yeah. done it. You, you know, um, this is what we need is a bit more connection to bring the learning to life. But at the same time, people having the digital access when they need it. Uh, maybe one of the contexts in which hybrid really, really works. Yes, 
You're right. And, and, and it is a nice hybrid uh, uh, use of the word as well. <laughs> so uh, the reason also I'm telling you all this, if you're still here, <laughs> if you is uh, if we, we'd love you to be part of uh, shaping this. So uh, I've created a new page in the virtualnotdistant.com website. So it's virtualnotdistant.com slash your opinion. I'll put a link in the show notes and there you can, well, you will be able to answer a couple of questions that I have around timing and stuff. That's very logistical questions. And I hope I'll have them by the time this goes out. And you can also sign up to uh, be a better listener of the course. So that's why I was uh, telling you all of this, virtualnotdistant.com slash your opinion. Right, Maya, before mm. we sign off, anything you want to say to our listeners? No, just hang on in there through this long, hot summer if you're in the UK or Europe or anywhere else going through it and enjoy whatever flexibility you can in, in your lifestyle and your work. And we'll be back soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. A big thank you to Ross Winter for polishing the audio of this episode. And thank you listeners for choosing to listen to the 21st Century Work Life podcast. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and you can check out the full show notes over at virtualnotdistant.com slash podcasts. Talking of podcasts, we have another show you can listen to, Management Cafe, which you should also be able to find on all podcast apps. I have been Pilar Ortiz. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.